So thank you. Uh, as part of this presentation, I hope to empower uh, you to understand the different legal tools that can be used to not only mitigate risk as you move forward with this startup, but also hopefully build some value uh, and reliability and potentially some assets. Uh, myself, I'm a, an engineer and a lawyer uh, practicing particularly in IP and technology law. Uh, I'll hit on uh, some areas of law a bit outside of that. And if you have further questions in those space, we have a, a large network of uh, colleagues we can leverage to answer your question in the future. So I'd like to frame this presentation as a series of relationships. So when you go start your business, uh, you move forward, you have to build relationships with uh, different parties. And it's through those relationships that you have to think about how the legal tools are there to frame. Uh, the two when you first start out uh, that really come to mind will be uh, founders. How, what's the legal relationship between the founders and competitors? How are you leveraging your intellectual property in R&D? So which, and because when you're starting out, uh, there's limits on resources that you can use. Uh, we often, or I'll often get people come and say, what do I do first? I, I've got this product I want to move forward with. Uh, do I need to incorporate? Do I need to file patents? And it'll really depend on your individual circumstances, but generally the first two things are that, either put together your founding documents, or put together your IP, and whichever one you don't do, you usually do the next one after that. So for the first one, for founders, you wanna make sure that the relationship between the founders is well-defined, um, and there's ways to do that, depending on what type of structure your business has. So you wanna define what the responsibilities are, the, the founders between each other, and what the relative ownership is. So there's uh, different types of business structures. Uh, there's sole proprietorship. This one, you don't actually have an agreement between two people because this is a business uh, that's in one person's name. You can register your business under another name, but legally it belongs to that person. And all the risks and benefits also inure straight to that person. Uh, another type would be a, a partnership. This is typical when uh, two people uh, are giving equal, uh, equal rights and equal responsibilities and equal capital uh, typically. And they definitely want a partnership agreement to, to lay out what the, the rights and responsibility of each person is going in. And then by far the most common would be a corporation, right? This is, uh, a corporation is actually under the law uh, a separate entity it's its own legal person that means it can take on its own debt it can take on its own revenue and pay taxes and more importantly it can take on its own liability so it acts as a shield for the founder so when people sue the corporation in most cases they can't also sue the founding people and the last and not the last one, but the last one I'll hit on here is not-for-profit. This is very similar to a, a corporation, but it's, uh, as the name suggests, it's where you're not taking a profit. Generally, people who do not-for-profit uh, have an eye to become a charity, or maybe even nowadays, they have an eye to being you know, a social enterprise, uh, a company just uh, looking to do good in the world. But in any type of these situations, you definitely want to uh, think about uh, the founding documents and put enough detail in there to help yourself later on. You want to address what happens when there's a divergence of minds. You know, founders will go into a, a venture together with the best of intentions. But what happens later on when 
one investor does uh, one uh, founder doesn't want to take investment and the other one wants to bootstrap it and you have to have some sort of uh, details in the founding documents that lay out how how uh, how arguments or how decisions are made uh, such as having voting rules you know if it's an incorporation maybe uh, someone will have uh, more voting shares and can sign off against the board for the board uh, you also want to have you know who owns those shares can they transfer those shares the shares in themselves can have different rights perhaps uh, the shares uh, have different classes some may be voting some may be silent you know can you are you allowed to if you're going to get investment are you allowed to dilute those shares there's a lot of things that you want to think about when you're looking at a founding document and with that said and what i'll probably hit on more than once is take caution with internet precedent you know with founders agreements especially like at a place like y space or other incubators there's generally you know there might be startup package deals uh for incorporation and shareholders uh so if you have those resources available it's much better than than going with a, an internet precedent uh you know we we have packages ourselves and we can work with corporate lawyer colleagues um to address like uh the special needs like if you're going with uh one you found off the internet you know it, it might be have a, a a different structure than what you envision for your company it might have different rights allocation than what you envision uh, between the different founders. So you have to be careful when you take internet precedent. And if you do work with, uh, with a package or with a lawyer, make sure to lay out to them, not how you envision the company look like now, but also into the future. So the other big one, which I hit on was your relationship with competitors themselves. So uh, you generally do that with intellectual property. So it's with intellectual property is how you protect uh, the different aspects of your research and development, your brand. And I'll go into each one a little bit. So th by far the one with the, the greatest scope of protection would be patents. This protects inventive things you're doing, you know, your research and development. It's pretty rare situation that uh, an early stage company wouldn't at least have something to think about, uh, especially one in product development or software development. Uh, the benefit is that uh, in exchange for telling people how your invention works, you get 20 year exclusivity, a monopoly to stop other people from uh, practicing your inventive idea. And not only that, if it, it we see this often, it becomes an asset for company value. Uh, we'll get companies, I mean, we have companies that, you know, right before a raise, they'll look to start filing patent applications because investors do look at it favorably. I'm not saying that's necessarily the right situ situation for you, but it is something that investors do look at uh, favorably. There's some caveats with uh, patents and particularly the most uh, one you have to be careful of is public disclosures and sales. So if you publicly disclose how your invention works, such as in a white paper or a, present, a public presentation to investors or a, a committee or whatever, or if you sell the product uh, that encompasses that inventive idea that could negatively affect your ability to get a patent application or patent later on. So you have to be very careful with patents as timelines are very important. Uh, also with subject matter, sometimes it's, uh, it's a bit of a gray area. What is really technical enough to become a patent and what is not 
uh, it's really an area that takes a lot of expertise and experience to understand what the not only what the patent office looks at but what the courts look at in defining what is and what isn't a patent uh, if you have any questions on that uh, feel free to reach out uh, with patents also uh, there are long time frames so typically you're looking at two to three years to get a, a US patent from filing. Uh, there are ways to accelerate that. There are ways to push it off in case you wanna push off the costs. Uh, generally, patents in general, there are a lot of different strategies you can take depending on what your resources are, what, your, what, what you value as, as far as how quickly you need it, how quickly infringes are, are possibly gonna come into the picture. And also with that strategy, you have to remember that patents are granted generally per country or per region. So you have to file in each country you want protection. The other big one that uh, is very, very valuable is trademarks. So this protects brands and goodwill. So this will protect that, that name that you thought so hard over that logo that'll protect people seeing that brand and logo and associating it with your company with your product with the good experience they have with your product and it'll stop other people from trying to take advantage of that goodwill and use it and steal away uh, from your product and for that kind of value they're relatively inexpensive and quick and the benef another benefit is that you can file before you actually use it. So you don't actually need to be in the market uh, using the product. You can uh, file a patent, uh, a trademark application before you actually go to use it. Uh, one, one of the caveats is that it is only, uh, the trademark itself is only good for the associated goods and services. So you can't come up with a name and then expect, like you can't come up with uh, a name, uh, trying to sell chairs uh, with a specific name. And then you can't expect then to be able to stop someone from selling maybe cars with that name. It has, to, you're, you're limited by which goods and services I, you associated with the mark and it's in creating those goods and services where a bit of uh, finesse and expertise goes a long way and one thing uh, we see often that or one thing to take in mind is that when you go forward with coming up and putting all that thought into uh, your name and logo for your company try and go for something that's unique and non-descriptive, especially for trademarks, that'll make it a lot, uh, a lot easier not only to get the mark, but to have more uh, a broader scope of protection and more goodwill coming your way. Uh, so something like Xerox or Google, words that don't really have any other connotation outside of that company, those are good type of marks. Uh, so for trademarks, uh, you typically want to uh, make sure you do a search or you file before you actually adopt the mark. We do see companies that you know are about to go to market or even have gotten to market. They put all this work into building up uh, a goodwill behind this name, and then they find out that it's infringing someone else's trademark and then they can't use it then they have to go and pivot to something else so you have to be careful make sure to put thought into uh thinking about whether you'll have the right to use a mark before you actually go and enter the market and like with uh with patents it's per country but with trademarks uh, whereas with patents uh if you file in Canada, there may be some protection against someone filing the exact same patent in another country. 
uh, in trademark, there is not really such protection. So you have to be careful that uh, your strategy is such that you're not going to get pushed out of some countries that later on you'd like to enter. Uh, just uh, as a little bit of a, a example of, you know, what just a logo or a name can be valued. This is a, a company that called Interbrand that values different brands and like the numbers here are pretty amazing. So now trade secret and data are sort of similar in that a lot of uh, the ideas behind trade secrets or data are not necessarily uh, patent enforceable, so they likely fall under trade secret. Uh, so with trade secret, you have the benefit of, whereas a patent, you have to disclose it. In a trade secret, you could keep it secret, you could keep it under wraps, and you don't have to tell the world how it works. So that's great when patents are unenforceable. It's also great because there's no extra filing and examination costs. However, there are definitely caveats with trade secrets. Uh, you must have good contracts because trade secret is really just based in contract law. You have to have good contracts with your employees to make sure they're not gonna disclose it. With your contractors, even, um, even possibly with your customers, you know, if, if you're a data supplying type of com uh, company, you have to be careful that the data you're supplying to uh, some company to use, they're not gonna go and disclose. So you have to not only have good contracts, but also have good uh, systems in place to limit access to that secret data or secret trade secret and your secret data. And remember that there's no third party protection here. So if someone comes up with that idea themselves, that's part of your trade secret without, uh, without a chain leading back to someone disclosing it from your company, they have a right to use that and they have a right to patent it themselves. So uh, you have to be careful as to uh, what may be a reverse engineerable or what may be able to be determined on its own. Hey Mark, I'm seeing uh, there's actually quite a few good questions here coming up in the group chat. Okay. And you know, maybe it's a good time to pick up on some of those. Sure, how do I? I think at the bottom, if you hit chat, you should be able to see them on the right hand side there. Okay. Can you see it, Mark? Yeah, I can see it now. Uh, sorry, just because of the screen share, it sort of. Oh, yeah, out. right. Um, Okay. Yeah, so the question is, is it okay to share information uh, after a patent is filed? Yeah, that as far as the patent goes, you are okay to then disclose uh, the information. It won't hurt your patent rights going forward, so long as whatever you're disclosing is described in the patent. When you do file a patent, uh, it is uh, private for the first 18 months generally. So uh, you are given the opportunity to hold it in confidence for 18 months, um, but you are free to, sh to publicly disclose it once you file it. So typically people will file a, what's called a provisional application for, for relatively cheap. And then uh, making sure that that describes all the information and then they can go ahead and and disclose. Uh, as we're in Canada, do we need to file, both, uh, file patents in both Canada and the US, probably other countries too? Yep, so it is per country. So, but generally there are ways to uh, delay having to decide which countries you want to enter. So a very common strategy is you file a provisional application in the US describing your invention. And then uh, in a year, 
you decide which other countries you want to file, including if you want to file a, a standard US application, or you file what's called the PCT international application. And there are some benefits to that, but basically you're paying to then be able to delay uh, deciding which countries for a, an additional 18 months. So it's different strategies you can go for with. Um, there's trademarks per country too. Yep, trademarks are per country as well. So uh, with trademarks, you can file in a country like, um, like Canada, and then you get six months to file in other countries. And if you file in those other countries at six months, they'll have the same effective filing day as if you filed in Canada. Uh, so you have to have an eye towards which countries you want to enter, um, but you can file in other countries down the road, even after those six months, so long as someone else didn't go and possibly usurp that mark in the meantime. Uh, what type of protection should I use for a software application, if any? That's a tough question on the face of it. So with a software application, you could have patent, uh, patentable rights. Uh, you certainly have copyright rights, which I haven't hit on yet. Uh, you possibly have industrial design rights uh, in the way that it looks. And you potentially have trademark rights in you know, the name of the software application or uh, aesthetics towards that. With respect to patents, it's a very good question. It'll really depend on what the software is doing. Are you, is the software solving a technical solution or is it maybe just implementing a, uh, a way of organizing human behavior? So like a, a good example I, I like to use is like think about Uber, like the idea of matching a, a rider with a driver is probably not in itself patentable. That's just the way of organizing human behavior or implementing a business method. But maybe underneath it, there is some algorithm there that matches them better or more efficiently than a, another uh, previous algorithm. So it's that algorithm that's solving the technical problem that's maybe uh, patentable. Uh, but it, it would be hard to say right now. It, you can feel free to reach out uh, on no obligation basis. I can help you out uh, with the specific details. If a trademark is granted, then are you good to go using it uh, without infringing, oops, the trademark's going to good to go using it without infringing what's out there. Uh, yes, probably. Uh, if a trademark is granted, so what happens when you file a trademark application, the examiner will take a look at it. Uh, one of the things he'll do is he'll check if it's confusing with another trademark application in that specific country. So generally, if you get it granted, then your trademark is probably not confusing, but that's not to say someone might not still take you to court and say that the ex examiner is, was wrong, which he's allowed to do. But uh, getting a trademark granted is a pretty good indication that it's safe to use. Uh, is it possible to patent a software idea building a CRM or CMS? Uh, yeah, that sort of goes back to what I just said. It'll depend on, it'll depend more on the details. Uh, with respect to software, it, it's really about, can you give us the details so that we can explain to the examiner, you know, that that you really solved the technical problem that people were having problems with before. If you're just trying to solve 
uh, a business problem, uh, then it'll be harder. Uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, you can uh, have my email at the end, but my own email is mark, M-A-R-C, at boleyiplaw.com, B-H-O-L-E-I-P-L-A-W.com. Oh, I see that enough piece wrote it. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll just continue on. So industrial design is another type of protection. It does apply to, to software to some extent. Industrial design protects form and aesthetics. So uh, the, the typical one you'll hear of is, you know, the Coca-Cola bottle, it has that distinctive shape. So uh, it protects, you know, the form and aesthetics. Uh, it gives you 10 to 15 years exclusivity. It's very inexpensive to get. And it does apply to software, you know, if, if you designed that app to look a certain way uh, that you want it to be distinctive to you, you can look to protect it. Uh, the caveat is that it protects things that are substantially similar. So it's not quite as uh, broad a scope as uh, utility patents that have to be substantially similar. Um, and it protects uh, non-utilitarian, generally non-utilitarian aspects. So it has to be something that's not necessarily functional, but more on the form and aesthetics of it. And it's generally static, so how something looks at a particular time. But it, it's really in, in industrial design that you can see that you can really layer IP rights. So for example, we have, a, a, it's because they overlap the different IP rights. We have a, a client that, uh, that is an auto parts supplier, and then this COVID-19 stuff came and they pivoted to make uh, face shields with like a headband that you can uh, like you can uh, take off the face shield on and off to switch it out if it's dirty. Uh, so this has many different uh, aspects to it. So we we filed in industrial design because they're inexpensive and they're quick. Uh, we filed uh, trademarks into. Um, the, the way that it looks. We also filed utility patents uh, because they're stronger, but they take longer. So, and because of the quick nature of COVID-19 and people need it now, the, like layering the different IPs allows them to uh, get stronger rights later, um, but the strategy allows them to get at least something down quickly now. Uh, Another one is copyright. So this protects creative works. Uh, so the ones you'll hear of are, you know, books, movies, plays, uh, and those sorts of things. But it's also important to note that it does also protect software uh, in itself, uh, the way the software works and the code itself. And it's automatically created at the date it's created. You can file copyright registrations uh, if you want just an evidence that it was made out of this day by you but those aren't examined and uh, different countries have different lengths but in Canada it's uh, the length of the copyright is life plus 50 years uh, exclusivity some caveats is that it protects expressions not necessarily ideas um, so it only protects uh, so like a, a way to think about it is, you know, like the Monopoly game, it protects the way that Monopoly game looks, but it won't protect the actual gameplay itself, generally. Uh, it protects against substantial taking. So if someone takes a very minor piece of it, it might not fall under copyright, but the courts are generally pretty uh, giving to copyright owners that uh, people can't take too much. Uh, one thing to very important to remember is that it generally belongs to the author. So when you're a company and you have employees or you have contractors, and they're doing something creative or they're developing software for you, 
you better make sure that in any sort of agreement or contract with them that the copyright is going to revert back to you. Uh, we've had situations where developers want to own the software. Well, companies hire developers. The developers want to basically own the software and license it back to the company, whereas the company obviously wants to own the software that they paid for. And another thing very important is to think about is open source problems, right? Uh, companies will, I can tell you not to use open uh, source, but, or open source with problematic licenses, but generally people will do it. So you want to make sure to keep, put your mind to what type of open source um, libraries or tools you're using and what licenses those tools are under. There are problematic licenses like GPL and there's more permissive licenses like MIT. We've had uh, situations in the past where we'll do, do actually do due diligence for uh, investors and a company at like a, a series B raise the the investors will want them to do an open source audit and then at that point they realize oh crap we have all these open source uh, tools we're using and we're not really allowed to use them so then they have to either go through the situation of trying to get licenses or changing their software or delaying the raise these are all problems that if uh, companies looked at right away it would be a lot more helpful Hey Mark, let's uh, let's take a quick look at the questions because I think we're going to be moving on from the IP considerations. So there's a couple okay. more IP questions in here. Uh, okay, is that the same as a design patent? Industrial design, yeah, is a design patent. So in the states, they call it a design patent. In Canada, in other countries, it's called industrial design, but they're essentially the same thing. Should you copyright before showing investors? So with copyright, uh, you actually get it as soon as you, uh, you create the work. So unlike uh, trademark or patents where you have to file, copyright, you actually uh, don't have to file. You are granted the right to, to uh, ownership as soon as you make it. So um, you probably don't have to uh, copyright before showing investors, but if there are other rights there, especially patent rights or uh, industrial design rights, you want to make sure that uh, you file those before you show a publishing house. Do I have ownership rights of the code? All right. So, uh, sorry, I guess I should read it out. So, do I have ownership rights of the code I write for companies? Uh, am I able to reuse them or not? Most of companies state the code written by the employee as trade secret or company's property. For example, I've written multiple table data structures for multiple companies. Can I use the same structured code for my own application? So, uh, so that will go into uh, the agreement. It's something really to be negotiated, really. I, if you're a developer and you're developing code for other people and you only want to give them the end product, generally a lot of agreements will do this delineation called like background IP and foreground IP. So you want to make sure anything you're writing that you want to be able to use again for other companies is classified under the background IP and anything you want the the company to be able to own would be classified under foreground IP. A lot of times the delineation is like what you come in with. So the background IP is the stuff I've already made uh, on my own dime or on another dime that I'm coming in with that I'm giving the company a right to use as part of their software, but the company doesn't own that in itself. How to copyright an online course. Um, it's actually uh, interesting. I did have uh, people come with recently ask me about online course. So 
uh, a, so as I said before, a copyright does uh, come as soon as you make it. Sometimes though, you may want to file in, a, in the copyright office uh, as evidence of your ownership. So for, I don't know what, uh, what service you're looking to, to upload it to, but some services will uh, look more favorably if you have a, a registration there in place to show that you are ownership. Uh, so it's something to look into. Uh, though you want to be mindful of the fact that uh, you only get copyright like if you're making videos as part of that online course, you're only getting copyright in the video itself, not necessarily in the material. Uh, there's a like there's a famous case in the states. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers like Tai Bo. It was like a fighting or boxing exercise, and he was trying to to basically copyright or like all fighting. Uh, or boxing exercise and the court space said no that you're trying to copyright the idea you really only get copyright over the the videos themselves if i propose the solution to my previous company an idea not an algorithm recording uh that Oh, sorry, I guess I should read out loud if I, if I propose a solution to my previous company an idea not an algorithm or a coding project. Uh, is it possible to use that idea to establish a new business based on that idea? Uh, it'll depend on what the idea is. So as a general for patents, I, I generally in, in patents, uh, employees have an implied obligation to assign uh, as, assign the the patent rights to their employer where the idea is part of the is is part of the 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 duties of the job so if the idea was something maybe not related to what you're doing for that company perhaps uh, it it is not a patent and can't be considered a patent based on your definition. Uh, a, it'd be hard for me to say, uh, it'll depend on what it is, I guess. Um, Mark, do you mind if I just also jump in on these questions? Yeah, these questions? yeah go ahead. I think the interesting thing about like a lot of these copyright based questions, um, everything from uh, Robert Halley's question at 635 onward, the fun, I, I'm not the funny thing, but copyright's a bit different uh, in terms of practice than a lot of the other IP. And Mark already touched on this, that copyright just exists. It just exists when you create something. So whether it's a piece of art or music or code, the moment the, uh, the keystroke is hit, the copyright exists. Whereas for patents and trademarks and um, industrial designs, there is more of an active registration in most cases, other than some trademark rights. So, because of that, copyright rights and the transfer of those rights is very heavily a contract-based negotiation. And Mark, sorry, again, touched on this as well, but there are default rights and then there's everything else. And most things are not dealt with default anymore, right? When In, in a lot of these scenarios that are brought up in the questions, it seems like what's happening is somebody creates something under a prior employment. It is very likely the employment agreement for that arrangement covered this concept of this eventuality. So the basic answer to any of these questions is you gotta look at what the agreement says. And then from a founder perspective, which I think a lot of you guys on this call are founders, you're now taking the mantle of being that person controlling the agreement. And so from your perspective, you'll want the verbiage in those agreements to be clear that anything, whether it's an idea, an algorithm or code, or anything in between, you know, a GUI, the, the concepts of what's gonna be in a, in a particular solution, all of those things should be assigned to the company. So to the extent that under, for example, just random example under Alex Samari's um, example where he wrote code for company, can you reuse it or not? 
from an employee perspective, hopefully the agreement was really poor. And from the employer perspective, hopefully it was rock solid. But it all depends on what the agreement said. I also want to uh, just go back to Robert Halley's question about should you copyright before showing investors and publishing houses? So as Mark said, and as I just repeated, um, copyright, it just exists. So let's say you're writing a book or a manuscript, the copyright exists. And quite typically, especially for things like code or for a presentation, it's very rare that someone actually files for the copyright registration, which you can do. And it's actually like very low overhead. It's pretty inexpensive and fast. You can get a copyright registration certificate for whatever it is you're creating. Now, if you're presenting something to a publishing house, quite frankly, you probably do want to copyright it, register it, like register it. If it's an old form of content, whether it's an actual painting, a song, a book, uh, those are the kinds of things that you probably should bother copywriting it uh, with a registration, I mean, and that would be good. Now, in terms of the investors, uh, the investor question is important because outside of the copyrighted uh, area, and again, Mark did already touch on this, but I just want to repeat it because this is very important. We have a majority of our clients are, are technology companies. And the question of when to protect your IP in relation to speaking to investors is a, a utmost important question. And it, it relates more to the patent side. So to the extent that you have innovative technology, and you want to present that to an investor, and I'm not going to say 100% you should file it as a patent application, but we would heavily advise that if it is patentable and if you have an appetite to eventually patent it, that patent needs to be filed before you talk to the investor. And in that sense, the investor discussion is the threshold event of having filed a patent application or not that is going to have broad enforceability. Sorry to interrupt the, uh, the flow, Mark. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you take it back. No problem. Yeah. Thanks, those are uh, good points. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I, this hits pretty much on what Ano was talking about. Uh, when you're a founder, you, uh, after you deal with the founder's agreement and potentially after you deal with some of the IP issues, you wanna put your mind towards uh, putting in agreements in place with your employees and in independent contractors don't leave it to oral handshake agreements. Um, and whether someone is an independent contractor or an employee uh, will not always necessarily do with what's written in the contract. Uh, under law, uh, it'll have it's it's more to deal with whether some factors under law are made out, you know, how much control do they have? Do they have the ability to make income elsewhere? So you want to definitely consult with uh, people uh, when you're making uh, in independent contractor agreements or employee agreements so that they aren't actually an employee when you meant them to be independent contractor, then you have to give them benefits and all the other rights an employee is granted. Uh, and as Anil touched on, make sure in these agreements you do have uh, confidentiality provisions in there so they can't go and spill the beans, the secret sauce, and make sure that there is also uh, IP provisions so that uh, people actually have to actively assign the IP to the company. Uh, I think uh, we're dealing with uh, a company now who's puts uh, who, who's going to file who filed some IP. They one of their uh, employees has since left, but they are an inventor, and now uh, they want the, that inventor to actively assign the IP to the company, and that inventor is refusing. And there was nothing in the employment contract to say that they had to actively assign it. So you want to make sure that uh, there's no leeway in these sorts of agreements as far as what the rights of the employees to assign to the company. As part of these agreements, you could also include non-compete or non-solicitation. So 
there's strict requirements generally under law for non-compete, especially if they're towards a single person. So non-compete is you're saying they can't uh, compete with your company or work for a com competing company for a, a certain amount of time, but these have to be very limited and very reasonable. Non-solicitation is a lot, little more broad. It's basically that they can't solicit away your customers or your clients uh, or uh, other aspects of your business. But still, they have to be written reasonably and they can't be too broad or else the court will just uh, discard them. Our indefinite NDA is automatically discarded by the court. Uh, indefinite as in uh, uh, no time limit. I I wouldn't say they're no. I wouldn't say they're di automatically discarded by the court. Uh, but generally, uh, with non-disclosure, you want to make sure that they're reasonable, um, uh, and go over the details of your particular IP. Uh, so another relationship you might have is with suppliers and developers, uh, maybe suppliers if you're a product, developer if you're a software company, uh, or physical products, I should say. Uh, make sure in any sorts of these type of agreements you obtain the rights you need. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, as we sort of hit on before with developers, make sure that the foreground and background IP is relatively made out and is straight uh, specific enough so that if you're the company getting that product you have uh, as much of the product as much as the the underlying code as you think you're getting uh, make sure there's recourse against non-performance or suboptimal informants so you know you want to make sure if if that's a if uh, they don't actually perform the contract or whatever they give you is not up to snuff, then you want to make sure that there's uh, provisions in there about what you can do about it. Uh, indemnities. So these are, so one popular indemnity is, you know, maybe uh, you're a, a supplier, you, you manufacture a product for your consulting company manufacture or a designer or manufacturer a product according to someone else's design you know and then there's some product liability lawsuit you know who's responsible there uh, you want to make sure if that you get sued there's an indemnity that they would have to cover it for because it's their design and then generally you want to define the relationship uh, all the different aspects about how you are going to interact with each other Monetization. I'm sorry, Mark. I'm, I'm going to just jump in again because I think there's another yeah. question here. Um, actually, I'm just going to field this really quick. So Alex has asked, are indefinite NDAs automatically discarded by the court? So I have to, um, oh, and Ashni is asking you to go back a slide for a second. So I'm going to address the indefinite NDAs, but I actually have to just clarify for a lot of, well, not a lot, for every uh, response that we're giving, everything that's being asked is relatively a broad question and everything has to be taken in context so forgive me for being lawyerly but uh, nothing we're saying on this presentation can be used as actual legal advice uh, if you do want some better guidance like more specific guidance we're more than happy to have you contact us one-on-one -on -one and go through your specific scenario and we can give you much better guidance in that case but it's very hard to give an answer yes or no especially a question like this are indefinite ndas automatically discarded by the court um, on Mark's slide, he was really referring to um, non-competitions, which are different than non-disclosure agreements. Indefinite non-disclosure agreements are fairly common, as are, as are time-limited NDAs. We can have a two-year NDA, a five-year NDA, but quite frankly, the default NDA we send out for our clients is not limited by a term. Uh, they're not automatically discarded by the court. And similarly, for a uh, non-compete, there's nothing automatic that it's gonna be discarded. It's just a question of reasonableness. If you are in a specific field where there is a plethora of options for your skills without having to compete with the particular entity you signed it with, it's more reasonable to request a non-compete. On the other hand, if you're in an area where 
you can either work for this particular company or its only competitor and they're putting you into non-compete, they're essentially re removing your ability to um, you know, make money and have a life. So that's less reasonable. And there, there's again, no bright line of what a court will and will not do. Everything in the Canadian common law system is based on the facts of the situation. And you have to essentially try to understand a reasonableness uh, inquiry on those. I'm not sure if Ashley had a particular question uh, to go back for a slide, but uh, this will be a good time to ask it, I suppose. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah, that is true. Uh, NDAs are a little bit different than non compete. Oh, so Ashley is also saying, just writing notes on this point. Again, uh, we are happy to share the slides at the end of the talk. You just have to email Mark, he'll send it to you. So here's non disclosure. Uh, once you have your IP, uh, you want to maybe think about how to monetize that IP. So uh, the first thing you can do is talk to investors uh, or talk to uh, uh, companies that will give you uh, credit. So, uh, and possibly also talk to different partners about maybe making the product or, or having other things to deal, deal with it moving forward. Uh, in the context that you can, a non-disclosure agreement is very beneficial. It'll uh, protect yourself, uh, not only getting patent rights down the road, but also protect yourself against uh, someone just using the product uh, that you spent so much time and effort in developing. Uh, not all investors will sign NDAs, but to the extent you can get them to sign, it would be, it's beneficial. Uh, one of the very common ways to monetize uh, IP is through uh, licensing that IP or a sale of that IP. So this is something uh, we commonly do. Uh, we, uh, companies will want to make sure that, uh, that the, the IP that they're licensing is done so in a way that, uh, that benefits them the most. You have to be a little bit careful. Uh, like I've seen people come with licensing agreements, uh, for example, for trademarks. Uh, but with respect to trademarks, you have to be careful because uh, the law states that if you're licensing a trademark, you can't just license it outright. You still have to have control over the product or the quality of the product, I should say. So when you're doing a licensing agreement, you have to make sure that uh, you're not just using something out of the blue. You have to make sure it's tailored to your particular situation so that you don't hurt yourself down the road. Uh, you can uh, have a services agreement if you're uh, looking to uh, provide services uh, to another company, for example. Uh, you could have manufacturing distribution agreements. These are similar in a way to the development agreements. Uh, think about different timelines. Think about uh, what happens if they're not able to complete it or it's not up to snuff. Uh, there's joint venture, co-branding agreements, similar to licensing or a trademark. You want to clearly set out what each uh, company is responsible for, who gets the IP at the end, what percentage of profits, what percentage of capital goes in, all those type of things are important to think about. And also down the road, you might want to think about enforcing your IP rights if there is an infringer out there. Uh, make sure that these sorts of things are in writing. Again, uh, don't rely on handshake agreements. Uh, they're not reliable down the road when there's ultimately an argument, which a lot of times there are. Uh, uh, as kind of stated before, make sure there's an out. People go into these sorts of relationship, partnerships uh, with the best of intentions, but oftentimes uh, they'll end up falling out. So make sure it's clearly set out what happens when there's a dissolution of the, of the partnership. And again, use internet templates with caution. Often, uh, we'll see internet templates. Uh, uh, often they're 
written for US companies, not necessarily with Canadian companies in mind. You know, it's very common to see uh, someone come in with an agreement, you know, when people go in and find internet templates, they're not just gonna use one, they're gonna go and find five and then make a mishmash of all of them. And then you'll end up with clauses that uh, are redundant, clauses that are contradictory with other clauses, uh, people with clauses that th they don't understand what the effects are. You know, maybe you just made that independent contractor an employee because of some clause you used. So you have to be careful with internet templates. Make sure, again, set out who owns IP. And to the extent you can, be specific. Be specific with the obligations of what someone going into it has to do with the timelines if they're uh, giving you different prototypes. Be specific of when uh, those timelines are and what happens if it doesn't work out. Be specific what the end product should look like, et cetera. Uh, with respect to, you also have a relationship with government and regulators. Uh, you know, you might be have to look on product liability law. Uh, there might be industry specific requirements. Uh, you know, if you're uh, in the medical device space, uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, regulations you have to look under. Uh, if you're in the pri uh, data collection space, there might be privacy implications uh, under different laws. So uh, these sort of, uh, there's privacy. So you have to be careful with privacy. Uh, it's very uh, a big thing nowadays and there's lots of new laws coming up. So you have to make sure that uh, do an audit of your privacy uh, requirements. Uh, what's the question? What's the difference between independent contractor versus employee if independent contractor is working four years a week at the company? So this again goes to like one of the situations where uh, potentially that independent contractor uh, is actually considered an employee, but it'll really depend on the circumstances, the relative uh, power of each company. There's other fat. There's a lot of other factors that may go into it. You know, is that independent contractor free to work with other companies? Is that independent contractor free to uh, negotiate the what they're going to do? Uh, how much they're going to get paid for it? All those sorts of things. It's there's no black and white answer. It's sort of one of those things that uh, you have to ask. Uh, particularly like an employment lawyer would be able to give you the best answer. Uh, if you'd like a reference to that, we have uh, some good ones in our network. Uh, look at government regulatory approvals. Uh, and then you have a relationship with your customers, right? Uh, maybe you're a software company and you're beta testing. Uh, maybe you're a B2B company and you're beta testing some software and some other company is relying on that software. Uh, the beta testing by nature is buggy and now that, that other company's lost a bunch of money because the software doesn't work. Even when you're in these sorts of agreements, it's uh, beta testing, it's good to have uh, warranties in there and other things like that so you're not liable. Uh, Commonly, uh, we've all seen terms and conditions, terms of use, terms of service. Uh, make sure that when you uh, go to create these terms of conditions and terms of use that it's specific to whatever you're actually doing. Uh, I had a client come in and uh, she was creating basically like, like a platform uh, where people can upload certain things, but her terms and conditions didn't actually uh, waive liability against what people are posting. So like people could be posting illegal or nasty things to her site, but her, and uh, she was potentially liable because she didn't necessarily disclaim or give conditions on what, how people can use the site. So you have to be careful about uh, making sure it's directed towards how you're actually specific to your actual product. 
uh, end user license agreement for software, make sure that it uh, lays out what someone can and can't do with the software. For example, obviously you don't want them to copy it, give it to their friends. Uh, so make sure all that type of thing is in there. Privacy policy, a uh, very big one. Uh, we see a lot of privacy policies nowadays. Uh, so something I, I tell a lot of clients in privacy policy is you generally want to be forthwith, be forthwith about what data you're going to collect, what you're going to do with that data. Are you giving it to, are you sharing it with third parties? Are you anonymizing it? Are you sharing it with advertisers? Um, make sure you have something in place if there's a privacy breach. Uh, make sure that's in the policy. All those type of things uh, are very pertinent, especially uh, in other jurisdictions like Europe. Uh, so just be uh, mindful of uh, the data that you're collecting, especially also if you're collecting it uh, in the, any sort of health data. In Ontario, there's a very specific act with respect to health data that you have to make sure you're in compliance with. And uh, that's it. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the good questions and everybody coming to, uh, to listen. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, my email is there. Uh, I would be happy to uh to answer any questions thanks for having us real pleasure and i hope everyone stays safe and healthy and we're all back to regular life sooner than later <laughs>